Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another Sam Bids Live episode number 53, where we walk through small business solicitations together on Sam.gov and answer your questions along the way so that you too can start bidding and winning contracts on Sam.gov for your small GovCon business. Today is the first episode of the year of 2024, and it's so good to be back with you all. Today, we will be reviewing four small business solicitations that I pulled up on Sam.gov that we will be jumping into in just a second. But if you're new here and you don't want to miss future Sam Bits Live episodes, make sure you subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so that you can ask your questions live on future streams. And lastly, if you're just starting out and you're wanting to middleman government contracts the legal way, our new Legal Middleman book is here and available for purchase if you want to learn the, to middleman government contracts legally. And you can check out the book at our website, legalmiddleman.com slash book. And guys, it is the real deal. If you haven't gotten your copy yet, it's 200 pages. We worked with a straight up publisher, Transcendent Publishing on this one. Or you can take it a step further and get more than 40 legal middleman training videos along with all the templates you need for writing your proposals, working with subcontractors and even choosing from dozens of capability statements. And that's all included in our Legal Middleman course that you can check out at legalmiddleman.com slash course. So guys, if you are live with us, let me know what state are you representing? And if this is your first time being on the live stream, let me know that this is your first time, your first live in the chat as well. And in the meantime, while you do that, I'm going to go ahead and share a sneak peek with you all at the bids that we're going to be covering in today's episode. So for today, we have visual display at West Point. I'm not exactly sure what that means. We're going to get into it. It could be VTC, it could be something more structural in terms of like, I don't know, it could be a painting, it could be a portrait, it could be framing things. We'll see. We'll get into it. Second bid we're going to be looking at today is interpretation and translation services. Bid number three is a hazard tree BPA. So this is going to be a blanket purchase agreement contract. And we also have a strong bonds event coming up at uh, Baraboo, Wisconsin. Okay, so we'll be diving into those four bids for today's episode. And welcome back again. If you're just joining, jumping in, guys, it is the first episode of 2024. So happy to get back to it to see all of your virtual <laughs> smiling faces here as well, hanging out with us. We've got Shannon hanging out with us from Louisiana. We have Trey from Oklahoma. Big D, greetings from Chicago. We have uh, Didier Frank from Kissimmee, Florida. Hopefully I said that properly. Christian Bailey out of Missouri. Guys, we are all over the place. We've got Willie Trouble 88 from my old stomping grounds, Michigan. We have uh, Najee Vareen out of Florida in the building. Awesome, guys. And his first live. Welcome, welcome. So glad to uh, have you guys here. The book, it's actual. No, it's not a PDF. It's a physical book, 200 pages. Um, it's 30 bucks, and that includes shipping uh, for U.S. Uh, shipping locations. Uh, Shannon's first live as well. Awesome. Didi out of New York. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Pamela out of Charlotte. And this is also Pamela's first time joining. Welcome. So many uh, new folks here and returning faces as well. Uh, T Mac, this is first live. A lot of new people out of Maryland. Welcome, guys. Billy Bryant, hang out with us on LinkedIn today. Checking in from Michigan as well. And thank you for hanging out with us, Billy. Appreciate it. Edward Luttrell, first time out of Augusta, Georgia. Secured Cleaning Solutions. Welcome, Edward. Good to see you. We have a Truly Ashley from Chicago. Very first live. I'm excited to watch. Guys, I mean, I, I, you're going to make me blush a little bit because there's so many live folks here. Let's go ahead and just dive into it since we have so many first timers and welcome everybody. Definitely keep uh, keep the states coming if your state wasn't represented. But um, also, as you have questions as we go out throughout the episode, as we're about to begin, um, definitely put those in because I'm here to answer questions as well. And then just so you know, I don't look at any of these bids ahead of time. So I like to go through it raw and real with you the first time. That way, it kind of simulates what you're going to experience when you're probably already going on, Sam. Um, but as you're doing it, we get to do it with a bit more of a safety net. Because as you can see, and if you've watched past episodes, it doesn't always go like perfectly to plan. So you learn to kind of develop your skill set of kind of 
putting the pieces together, you know, putting the puzzle together rather, um, and what to do with situations where you don't know what to do, right? So let's go ahead and look at that visual display bid and happy 2024 to everybody. And if you're in the South like me, uh, we're gonna be rocked with storms uh, tonight. So definitely hope everybody is, is safe. And in the North, I think a lot of snow is coming off of these storms. So bid number one, visual display out of West Point. This is for the Army uh, MIC Mission and Installation Contracting Command, okay? This bid is due February 8th. So a bit of time on this one. Small business set aside with the 541-430 NAICS code. Again, West Point, uh, West Point being New York. In the description, they're saying they're seeking to elevate the overall cadet experience in the Mahan Hall through the debel development of design products that provide a cohesive feel between first, second, B and C floor hallways, including conference rooms, shared spaces, as well as the fourth floor display case. So we're thinking of like display cases here. Remember when I said at the beginning, I wasn't sure exactly what this visual display was gonna consist of. There's a little bit of the details to uh, help us out. In terms of attachments, we do have a uh, solicitation. Looks like we have one amendment as well as an attached PPQ, past performance questionnaire. So we can assume that they're probably gonna be wanting past performance as part of the proposal response on this. So let's go ahead and dive into the solicitation and see what we have going on. We're immediately met with the SF-1449 form with a, a statement of work to follow. Now, we don't know if this is gonna, it seems, it seems like it's gonna be like an install. And this could be a removal and an install. We not, we're not sure. Right here, they're just saying the project requires the design fabrication and install of the visual displays at the following locations. And they give us location one, two, with a further breakdown, okay? So you're likely going to work with a sub that, I won't say that they specialize in providing displays, although they could. If you could find one locally, it would probably be a great fit. Otherwise, you may find a sub that does this along with some other things, right? And then if you're someone who, who self-performs this, of course, you would be fulfilling the work yours, yourself. But this is a little bit, you know, it's not like construction. It's not even like renovation. They're looking more for the, the design and to make sure that, as I said, it flows and it ties together um, and it sounds like they certainly wanted it to look better than the way that they currently have it set up. So this is the statement of work again, and it will share much more of those details. All those details you would want to be providing to also, if you have somebody quoting the work. We are, okay, so we just kind of stumbled up here, you know. The following items are excluded from the scope. And they're saying paint, electrical power, blo uh, blocking, and then furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Then the project cost estimate. So they're introducing us to pricing clinics here. It's just one through four. And they're breaking that down by design, strategy with the plan updates, the fabrication, and then the actual install. So they want a price broken out by each of these. So this is actually telling us a lot to drive our, uh, our pricing decision-making, drive our conversation if we're getting estimates, and then also our overall understanding of the, con uh, of the contract because where they're putting the nails down in terms of the pricing, you better believe is gonna be what is gonna be the significant milestones of the overall job. So we know that of course, there's gonna be a price uh, included. I'll be looking for more is this RFP? Is this RFQ? I don't know. It seems like a small job, to be honest. Seems like it's below simplified acquisition. I can't say that for sure, but it seems like it. They're giving us site visit instructions for January 16th. So definitely still a future date, more than a week away. And that's going to, again, be Mr. Sean Velastro. I don't believe that would be the contracting, but it is. It is Sean Velastro. So very often there's a core or a PM 
who would be the one interfacing during the site visits. Uh, but they could just be asking you to communicate to get you on the list and that there still could be somebody else at the site visit itself. Still probably going to be the case. So we do have a 68 page document here. We've already seen the statement of work, pricing cleanse. This is a included copy. We see that there's a PP key here. They're attaching it here as well. So this would be past performance information that would be requested. So we know there's going to be price. We know there's going to be past performance, right? As what's required to respond to this with. We automatically go into our evaluation section here. And what jumps off the page is LPTA, as we probably could have suspected, which means that past performance, it's going to be a technically acceptable pass fail, check the box, not check the box type evaluation. It's not going to be how good is the past performance, how recent or relevant. It's going to be like, it's not recent, so we're throwing it out. It's not relevant, so we're throwing it out. Or it is recent and relevant, and we're going to use it. And it checks the box, and then we'll go to look at your price. That's how LPTA pricing is going to flow for this. As you can see, I didn't even get to it, but acceptable, unacceptable. As we just suggested the pass fail approach. And they are breaking it down by a technical factor one and a past performance factor two. So, and then a price factor three. We have the more formal pricing cleanse. 01020304. And these do mirror those earlier cleanse. So it is a little interesting that that they chose to make up their own cleanse to mirror the formal cleanse. Um, Derek, what do I do? Do I fill these out? Do I uh, just fill one of them out? I, I would just fill out both. Okay. If you have questions, though, always ask the person who has all the answers, which is contracting, at least as it relates to the way that they put together their proposal, they have all the answers. Um, we have our delivery schedule, POP kicking off one February through January 31st of next year. And these are going to mirror match for all four cleanse. They're giving you an entire year to do this. I don't think it's going to take that long. I think this would be knocked out in a week or two. I could be grossly wrong. There could be coordination issues, but I'm pretty confident this would take way less than a year. We have reps and certs. And my guess is we've already gone through what they're going to give us in terms of an instruction to offer a section, proposal requirements, etc. And like I said, they did mention technical that we saw in the valuation. So we may have missed that. So I'll just try to. So we have our PPQ here. Is there something before that? Site visit, anti-terrorism. So straight into the PPQ. Okay, we didn't miss anything there. Again, this is all PPQ information. And then it goes straight into evaluation. So it is a little interesting because we're not seeing a technical factor per se, and they're defining an acceptable technical response as one that clearly meets the requirements stated in the criteria. Okay, the most uh, vague boilerplate thing ever, which makes it difficult for us bidders to try to satisfy the requirement when contracting couldn't be more vague as to what that is. Right. So we've come through this twice now, and they're going straight from the PPQ right into evaluation factors. Well, what about the technical section? because we do have past performance table two here and they define what acceptable is gonna be. And we can line that up with the PPQ. So that makes sense. 
but I'm not able to do the same for the technical and I'm not really seeing it. So that could be grounds for submitting RFIs, okay? Uh, essentially they're saying write to the statement of work, but then when you write to the statement of work uh, incorrectly, then they complain and say, hey, don't just be a parrot and parrot back what's in the statement of work. As we often say, don't say what you're gonna do, say how you're, answer the question, how are you going to do it? And if you answer how you're gonna do it, it will give contracting more, more substance, more meat, and essentially more ability to rate and compare you to other bids. And good news is, is not all your competitors are going to do that. They say the what instead of the how. So when you do find yourself in a situation like this, where you don't know exactly what to write for a technical section because they're not giving it to you, but they're saying we want it, the kind of two safety net pieces, I don't even say safety net because it's not a safety net. The two pieces to build on, okay, you're not starting with nothing because that's the scariest thing. You're answering how you're going to do the work, but then you're also submitting RFIs to get further clarification. And um, I always say when submitting RFIs, if you're trying to gain more understanding and insight and feedback from contracting, ask open-ended questions instead of what's the opposite of an open-ended question closed questions questions avoid questions that are simple yes or no's unless that's all you're looking for um but if you're looking for feedback you can ask an open-ended question like will this suffice or can contracting please uh, provide an example uh, and they may not give you an example that might be too much but can contracting you give contracting an example and ask them if this is something that would you know, satisfy or that they would approve being uh, in the technical response since they've given you nothing. And then that gives them something to work with and they can give you a bit of feedback as an open-ended question versus like, hey, is the technical response really requested for this? We're not seeing it. And they say, yes. Okay, well, you haven't moved any more progress further. And, and now you're going to have to ask another question, which makes you look uh, maybe a little bit green at submitting RFIs, right? So open-ended questions and again, answer the how you're gonna perform the work instead of what you're gonna do. So let's go ahead and check in with the chat and hello everybody, hello, hello, who just joined us. Willie Trouble, I'm just looking for questions. Did the pricing section state that the pricing was not a factor in the evaluation? Um, nope, it was pricing was listed as factor three. So it was a factor. Tiffany says first live. Welcome, Tiffany. Um, and thanks for hanging out with us. Welcome to your first live. I'm filling out the 1449. Or am I just filling out the SF 1449 form or writing a winning proposal? Is there a difference? There's absolutely a difference. So very, very, I won't say very rarely because that's not helpful to say. In the instances where the bid is a request for quote and only pricing is required, it is possible that the only required response would be an SF1449 form, perhaps with the pricing CLINs attached. So that's gonna be print date sign price. Okay, that's the sim as, as simple as an RFQ response can get um, in the federal space as it pertains to what we look at. But your question is, am I just filling that out or am I writing a winning proposal? That question is answered in the solicitation. So we're talking about writing. More than half of writing, in my opinion, and as I always say, is, is really reading. As you read and you get better at reading, the proposal starts to write itself, especially as you do a few of these, because then you can use templates that you've you know, put together in the past, um, everything's got to be critiqued and tailored because every single bid is different. Sections got to be added, sections got to be taken out, right? Factors change, weightings change on what's most important for your overall strategy, right? So knowing that you're going to be reading for that information is going to help you with your approach to writing. So I don't, I have no idea what the answer is. Am I just filling out the SF1449 or am I writing a winning proposal? I would encourage you to look for the uh, section L and section M instruction to offers and evaluation factors. Um, and there are some, there can be some clues like we saw in this bid we just looked at. For example, we, we saw that a PPQ form was attached, 
before we saw it listed in the valuation um, section, section M in the solicitation. So looking for clues for like, oh, there's a PPQ, they're probably gonna ask for past performance, right? Um, that can that can help us. And again, like those clues can, of course, vary from bid to bid as, as well. So and continue to improve. If this is your first live, watch a lot of these episodes. I promise, Tiffany, it's gonna help you out a lot. And then I think some of these questions you have as it regards to your writing, is going to get a lot more clear and you're going to get a lot stronger. Your skill set's going to get is going to improve at um, not only answering these questions yourself, but following through and, and doing the writing, as you said, to write winning proposals. Um, Ivy Vine says, hi, can you show us exactly how you respond to this? That would probably take a little bit more time and we wouldn't. It's not what we do on the show. I don't write full blown proposals on the show. I do have a few videos that kind of show you how to do that. Um, for example, if you look for, uh, there's a janitorial video. If you search janitorial, um, that would probably help you to find that. We also have lots of examples and all the templates and everything in our course. If it's something that you're looking to get serious about, otherwise got hundreds of helpful videos on the channel. Um, but I, yeah, it's just, we can't do it for the whole show because it would probably take up the whole show. Um, Rachel says, what's the best way to ask for technical approach in certs along with past performance? Not sure I understand this question. What's the best way to ask for technical approach in certs? Who are you asking? Uh, asking a um, someone who's estimating the job, a potential sub or a teaming partner are you talking about? Um, I'm not sure because I don't know why you'd be asking them for certifications. Ivy Vine, how can I go about having you as a coach? Um, well, we have our book, our course, and our class. So depending on what level of learning you're looking for and your budget, we have kind of three different options at legalmiddleman.com. Our class is kicking off literally next week. Um, registration for that has closed, but feel free to email support at govkidmethod.com um, for kind of any questions that you have about ways that we could uh, work together. Stephen, um, I'm working on a proposal where the deadline to submit questions was it was December 19th. Due uh, date for offers is January 19th. Okay, so the Q&A deadline is December 19th. Offers due January 19th, month apart. No answer to Q&A has been posted yet. Is this normal? I can't put together my offer without the info. Yeah, Stephen, that's a, that's a great question. And I'm really happy to see that you are following the process you have rfis and you're saying i'm not bidding this unless i get this information that is a a great place to be in because uh, as new bidders often we'll try to bid something even if we're not confident in it which is partially okay but we don't want to just straight up submit something that we know is not correct just for the sake of submitting it that's what we don't want want to do right there's always going to be a little bit of that gray element just like with riding a bike or anything else where you and guys my we're experiencing storms right now and my lights are flickering so say a little prayer to the electricity gods that i don't lose power but if the stream suddenly ends that means that i lost power and when we lose power down here it usually doesn't um come back right away so just throwing that out there if the stream ends, I lost power. Say a little prayer for me, okay? Um, so yeah, again, it's, it's a really good thing to be asking this question. So again, let me now to answer your question. Is this normal? It is normal, uh, especially because contracting was probably off all of last week, taking extended holidays. So I would follow up this week. You could even send a follow-up today if you haven't. Um, and hopefully questions will be or answers rather are posted uh, this week. Yeah, I'm looking at the calendar right now. You're saying the 19th. So next Friday, the bids are due. The other thing here, Stephen, is if the contracting very often isn't the one who answers the questions. I don't know if you guys know this, especially if the questions are related to the scope of work. Uh, Stephen, I'm kind of getting this from your question. I'm sensing this. Contracting is also the middleman, right? They're the middleman between us, industry, and the end users, right? The engineers, the, the PMs, the whatever, right? The folks that actually use the good or service that you're providing as a contractor. 
So when you ask questions to contracting, they've in turn got to go give those questions and get the answers back and then give those questions to us. That takes time. That's another link in the chain. So it's very often that contracting could be back, but they're waiting on this person for answers. And if that's the case, guess what they're going to do? If it's taking too long, they're going to extend it again. So I wouldn't worry too much. I would just do your diligence and stay on top of it and know that behind the scenes, this is likely what it's what is happening, especially because we went through the holidays and also because we know that contracting is going to other folks on the inside to get those answers. And it could be taking a little bit longer. So in short, yeah, it's it's fairly normal. All right, we'll do one more and then we'll look at our next bid, okay? Do you download the reps and certs from Sam? You could, or just fill out the reps and certs uh, in the proposal. You could, uh, kind of kind of up to you, right? And then if you read the reps and certs inside the solicitation, it could say, if your SAM.gov entity registration is updated and your reps and certs are already completed and updated, you only have to check this one box on this little page and send that to us. So read it. Sometimes they say that, sometimes they don't. Very often it says that though, and all you have to do is check the box, which is read something like, yeah, my, my uh, registrations are up to date. My assertions and everything are up to date. Um, so I would say read it for that, but then there's no right or wrong answer. Some people like to just download it from the FAR DFAR report about halfway through inside your SAM. Others will just fill out the 20 pages, checking the box all over again, it takes a little bit of time. Or if you have a bid again, like I said, where you just do the one, you just do the one, but you got to read for it. So hopefully that helps. Let's go ahead and dive into our next bid for today. And great questions, guys. Uh, every single one of you guys, great questions. Um, feel free to keep them coming as we carry on here, carry through the storm, carry through the lights flickering and carry through to bid number two, interpretation and translation services. This bid is due January 10th, so two days, no time whatsoever on this. <clears throat> Total small business set aside, 541930 NAICS code, place of performance, Fort McNair, DC. So they're straight up calling this an RFQ, request for quote in the description section. And this is interpretation and translation services for the 24 counterterrorism senior executive seminar. They're saying the event dates will be January 19th through January 26th. So a week, seven days. So we know that we're looking for interpretation and translation services for a week at this counterterrorism seminar. Already we're like, okay, I this makes sense. I can visualize this, okay? We're, we're gonna be providing some people, some warm bodies to provide these services. It's only gonna be for a week. It's gonna be at Fort, Mac, Fort McNair. So this already makes all sorts of sense. Very similar to the last one, we're hit with a solicitation, an amendment, and a statement of work. So go ahead and start with our solicitation. So for this, we're hit with a SF-1449 form. We have some special instructions. This is a request for quote, once again, RFQ. So it's possible that this is price only, you know, coming to the question we had earlier about, do I just do the SF-1449 form or do I write a winning proposal, right? Like we, we come with this, we come into this with that question and then it's gonna fall into one of those two columns or a third column. But we know this is gonna be uh, probably price driven as an RFQ. Required information, um, any discount percentages and description of any related fees, and then required company information. It's going to be your typical company info here. Straight up, this is going to be lowest price uh, LPTA, once again, consistent with many RFQs. And you're holding uh, prices for 120 days. We go straight into our pricing cleanse. Again, this document is 36 pages, so not about like half the size as the last one we looked at. They're saying six each interpretation services six each the contractor shall provide services and on-site support six each is this six people is this six days we don't fully know yet but we do know that's the only pricing clin that we have and it was like seven days that they were asking for so 
Our delivery schedule will reflect those dates, 19th through 26th. And, and if you actually count the days, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, it's actually eight days if you're providing service on all of those days, not seven. This is our uh, cover telecom. And then we have evaluation section M. As I don't make this stuff up, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, but it is always the truth. Section M, our evaluation factors will parallel what they've already told us about the lowest price evaluation. And again, guys, we go in a super amount of detail because I know I go through it fast inside our legal middleman course. Um, many examples broken down by reading, outline, proposal writing, pricing, and the temp templates to back that up. So I know, especially for a lot of you new folks, like how do, you know he's doing this so fast. Um, that is the place to go for the slower, detailed breakdown. Um, again, inside the LMM course. So they're giving us again this, uh, the, here's the true section M. That was just an addendum. But again, on the very last page of this, they're giving us the, the pass fail, acceptable, unacceptable, consistent with LPTA. So kind of already knew this. But I, once again, we find ourselves at a bit of a loss. Here's our instruction to offers. This, the, okay, so this actually is the, the answer for what is required in my proposal. So they give us a little box here for this one. Every bit is different. Page limits, one page for the administrative section. Cover sheet with quoters quote, which includes the point of contact. Next, administrative section, part two. That was part one. Part two, complete the clauses and provision. No page limit. Again, that's going to include your reps and certs. Next, technical section, max eight pages, quoter technical specifications tells us about as much as the last one. And their definition of the technical section two is the quarter must meet all the salient characteristics as defined. The quarter shall submit sufficient information, description, quant description, quantities, and technical specs in the quote for the government to make capability meeting. So just a generic copy and paste boilerplate tells us absolutely nothing to help us write a compliant or competitive technical response. And then we have our price section. What they're saying is that part of the SF-1449 form including that one price including that we had. So once again, not much to go off of. Uh, we do have a PWS here, which I don't expect. Actually in this case, let's see, it's 20 pages. So again, not our backup, but what we build from, we can use the statement of work to build on top of to answer those specific questions that they gave us, for example, like the salient characteristics. But my gosh, it almost sounds like they're copy and pasting that from a product solicitation, talking about salient features. Um, but here they're talking about key personnel, okay, qualifications. They're citing uh, Arabic interpreter, French interpreter, AV technician. The big question I still have is the six each on the pricing since pricing is the driver on this. I really want to be clear so that I'm submitting an RFI on that. Can contradict please explain uh, the six each is this like what like what is this um, specifically specific tasks. Two Arabic and two French interpreters per language are needed. Okay, so we're trying to like add up to six right a program manager to handle the interpreter uh, interfaces, and then an AV person, an on-site tech. So is like, is that the six? Is it two plus two is four plus one for the manager, and one for the for the AV person? That would be six. I don't necessarily have a lot of confidence in that, but possibly. But it it could just be totally something different than that. 
in addition, they're, they're detailing out the actual AV equipment, how much equipment they need, including 40 uh, microphones, right? So a lot of stuff going on. And again, you're going to have to price all that out. So how are you going to price all of that in a CLIN that's saying six each, right? We would like to see the AV stuff broken out, possibly where to go. We would like to see maybe the individual uh, translation interpretation services broken out, French being a CLIN, Arabic being a CLIN, the AV being a CLIN. Um, don't necessarily have to have the PM be a CLIN. It could be part of the AV stuff, but it would help us as bidders quite a bit for something like this to be able to break down exactly what we're, we're pricing so that we're super clear on what contracting is asking from us. At this point, it's still unclear. And some of those things that I touched on would be drivers for me to submit RFIs on something like this. Najee says, would snow removal be a good uh, be a good service you would target this time of year? Um, it could be too late for snow removal uh, because from a, if you're middle manning, most snow removal companies probably are full for the year for their, for their uh, route, for the routes and their contracts very often like late summer and fall is a good time to get on their books to make sure they have room for you because coming in this late um there may be contracts for it but your ability to fulfill those contracts through a, a teamy partner and a sub could be very limited so it could end up being a no bid for you not because the contract's bad but the overall deal isn't going to work because you're not going to be able to satisfy the second half of the pie chart on that. Right. Um, you will learn that through time. It's something that I've learned, you know, I learned very early on just making like, you know, dozens and dozens uh, of calls uh, a day and hundreds of calls a week. Um, for example, my road salt story, and I have so many others, um, you learn that. And it is different for different services if you're into services. So it will come with time, but just to, straight answer your question. That's what I would say. Um, Annie, this is not pertaining to this particular bid, uh, but for material, for a material, where does it tell you if you're responsible to actually unload the material at the site? Um, it should be spelled out in the statement of work. So where does it tell you? It should tell you in the statement of work. If uh, unloading is part of you know, say it's like a logistics contract, right? Or if it's a transportation contract, um, if unloading is part of it, or they have their own crew and equipment that will do the unloading and you're just responsible for the transport part. So you can look at the statement of work. You can look to see if it's broken down as an individual pricing CLIN, or you can ask the question, if you're just not seeing it anywhere, then you have to ask that as an RFI to contract it. For facility services where something is installed, like LED lighting, would I buy the lights for installation to begin, or should we have the sub get the equipment? Um, depends on what you want to do. Um, it, for example, when you're looking at construction contracts, so like let's speak, like let's work backwards from a truth. When you're doing straight up construction contracts with the government, you don't you're, like you can't make profit on materials like you're not supposed to profit on materials if you were to be audited they, they wouldn't allow that okay you you have profit cleanse for that and you're going to also likely have your your own overhead and gna so when you're buying materials you're not marking up materials you're not supposed to hide money in materials okay so if that's the case it's not going to make that much of a like because if you're saying i'm going to save money right like you could but you shouldn't be like, marking it up there now this isn't a straight construction contract that's why i said let's talk to something that is truth and work backwards i'm just installing led lighting that's not necessarily going to be qualified as a construction x code um like they could but it could also be something maybe even more like audio video related uh NAICS codes not a straight av NAICS code but something similar um or just electrical NAICS codes. Uh, so that's what I would get started with for the train of thought on something like this. You like you can, but you also have to know what you're ordering. So very often if you're getting into specialty buys, 
uh, you're going to have to be an authorized reseller or um, have access to a reseller, right? And very often companies that do this will and you won't. So that could stop you from ordering it yourself. All things to consider because um, I'm speaking in generalities here because I don't know what the exact situation is. Um, so some things to think about, you may already know answers to that question, those questions for your particular bid, but things to consider nonetheless. Um, it, there's not necessarily anything right or wrong with doing one or the other, having the sub buy it or you buying it straight. Again, you just wanna make sure what's being ordered is proper and that if you are working with a sub as a teaming partner, they're okay with that for their own timelines. Um, and also where is it getting delivered to? Is it getting delivered to the government site? Then you're gonna be responsible for coordinating with the government to make sure that it was inspected and quality controlled and they accepted it. Um, otherwise your teaming partner is gonna be um, at least getting feedback on that delivery. So all things kind of can consider, I don't wanna muddy the question too much. I'm just kind of speaking around it since I don't know all the specs. Renegade, um, I'm bidding on a project. My issue is I don't have five years of experience. My sub does. My question is when I'm submitting the bid, in this case, what should I do? Um, there's some unanswered questions on that. Uh, I don't have five years of experience. My sub does. In this case, what do I do? Well, is, ex is experience required for the solicitation. If not, it's not a moot point. Um, not all bids ask for you to have five years experience. That's not like some blanket statement that every contract you go after, you need to have five years experience doing this. That, that's not even close to being a thing, right? If you're saying your particular contract is asking for that, and you're saying that your sub has that, good news is you can use subs past performance as part of your proposal, right? You're saying yes. So you can use subs past performance as part of the proposal. So that's good news because it sounds like you're saying that your sub does. So you would be able to put together a package that is compliant within your proposal. So that's that's good news. So it, it sounds like you're just needing to know that you can use subs past performance. So what do you do? You use your subs past performance. That's the answer. Yeah, it's an evaluation factor. So yes, use the subs past performance. The problem really would be is if the sub didn't have it, because then you wouldn't be compliant. You would get thrown out. So straightforward question, but a powerful question, because if you don't know the answer to that, you will be stuck. Okay, we have a hazard tree BPA. Moving on to our next bit. This is uh, USACE, which is the Army Corps. In terms of attachments, we have a BPA solicitation. Uh, BPA blanket purchase agreement means they're not necessarily buying anything, meaning when the contract is awarded, there's not the exact transaction. What it is, is it's a vehicle, and uh, this could be a single award BPA, but sometimes there's multiple awards where one or multiple contractors get a ticket to the show, right, to then bid on future task orders because their pricing has already been pre-vetted through this particular solicitation and the awarding of the BPA uh, award, right? So this is not going to result directly in something, but it will, and if you're the only one, they're gonna feed you task orders and then you will bid respond to those task orders if you're the BPA uh, winner, and then you will get to do these tree hazard type jobs for the contract, uh, which could actually be a lot of work. Um, it's enough work to be a BPA. Uh, they wouldn't do that for a small little job. So that's actually encouraging. So this is a uh, Weston or West Alton, Missouri, small business set aside due January 22nd, 56173 landscaping services, NAICS code. We have, again, we've already covered the attachments. So let's go ahead and dive into the BPA solicitation. Okay, so we have our, you see how this looks? See how it looks different? You know, the VA does it different. The Army does it different. The Army Corps does it different. Uh, DOT does it different. Like, 
Border Patrol, those are different. Everybody's bids look a little bit different. A lot of what we do is the, the Army and DOD, though. Um, and those are often pretty similar. So 81 pages. First hit with Section 1, Statement of Work. We're going to see a lot of these different locations. Again, we're looking tree removal or, or tree hazard. So think tree hazard. Cleaning up tree mess, falling trees, dangerous trees, hazardous situations that are probably trying to be prevented or have already happened. Hazard tree and limb removals. Uh, so again, this would give us more detail on what that work is going to be. They have stump removal, just to paint the picture. Stump removal, uh, live limb removal, emergency call outs, and a lot more. Security and then wage termination. Again, wage determinations. Do they, do they tell you what you have to pay your people? No, they don't. They just they indicate the minimum amount that must be paid for federal con uh, for anybody working on the federal contract. So price and clean, we have hazard tree BPA one. That's it. That's it. So very often with BPAs, they'll give you kind of like a scenario or a situation to price off of. And so what will likely be the struggle with this one, and this is really kind of paramount. <clears throat> and this is, uh, looks like it would be five years, base plus four as well. Um, not even base plus four, just, just straight five years to be on the BPA. And they've given us our instruction offers here. This is the boilerplate instruction offers. See instruction offers. But this is kind of the, the boilerplate one out of the FAR that doesn't tell us much. So we're going to be reliant on the evaluation factors. The government will award a contract resulting based on what's most advantageous, yada, yada. The following factors will be used. Required insurance, say in the PWS, right? So they're talking about the general liability insurance. We saw that. And then two, required equipment necessary. Again, insurance and equipment is the evaluation factors. Very, very interesting to say the least. And then they give us the reps and certs. Uh, what? I got to see what else have they given us on this. Wow. This is probably the worst one of the day. Um, they have an amendment. Maybe this is answers the questions. I hope it just seems very, very lacking information. This is just editing a clause. Government, uh, no. The government will send an email to contractors, point of contact. The email RFQ will contain requirement description, applicable maps, links, response date. So what is this all about? PPA is not effective until signed. So If interested in quoting, the contractor shall return a copy of. If interested in quoting, the contractor shall return a completed quote to the government by the date and time. The contractor is not required to quote on every RFQ, and negative responses are not required. The government will not evaluate or award prior to the response date. It's not. It's not very helpful. And then a word decision will be made. 
awards will be issued off of call orders, right? I call them task orders, but call orders against the BPA master. Not very helpful guys. And I'm, I'm not very happy with how they're doing this one because I think this could be a really a good opportunity. And I think it would be difficult to even formulate some of the right questions for this. So I'm not really happy with this. And I did, I don't know what type of uh, turnout contracting is expecting. If they're just looking for equipment and uh, insurance as they've listed as the evaluation factor, it's it, that doesn't give you enough to go off of their their single pricing clin for this, especially for a BPA. So I'm um, not happy for this reason. It could even be a strong pass, a strong no bid for something like that. Would be worth uh, looking into it more, reading it more thoroughly than the few minutes we spend on it. But just at the high level, I I'm, really have a bad taste in my mouth about that for, for those reasons. Um, what type of agreement do you make with subs? Do you worry about them stealing the contract uh, agreements like subcontractor agreements, teaming agreements, NDAs, things like that. And then uh, you want to, you do want to investigate, search Sam, try to find their entity. Um, this is part of the education and discovery piece, discovery call when you're first reaching out to potential partners on this, um, finding out what their level of experience in government contracting is. And um, we cover all of that in the course too, as well. We also do have on um, the section on it in the book, uh, if you're looking at diving more into it, or if anybody is, um, help you to kind of navigate how to do this. I'm stealing the contract can only happen if they're eligible to bid on it direct. So if they don't have a gauge code, they're not eligible. If it's set aside for a certain set aside and they don't have that, they're not eligible, right? So there's certain things that you can easily kind of find out and dive into. Um, to not have to worry about that. But yeah, it is a concern that should be at the very beginning. And the goal is to answer that question for yourself so that you don't work with them or invest any time with them or that much time with them um, without having that answer. So it's something you wanna get answered pretty quickly. Past performance is just work that has been done from you or from your sub. So yeah, the technical answer is um, because you may run into this Past performance, past experience, experience, past performance. These terms get used kind of synonymously and they're actually not the same. So for the right way to understand this past performance is work that you've past experience is the work that you've done. Past performance is how well you've done on that work or how you performed on that work. So experience, would be the scope, the magnitude, the customer, right? The past performance is how well you've actually performed. So this is the technical differences between the two. A lot of people don't know that performance versus experience. However, even in government contracting and federal solicitations, we'll see past performance or we'll see PPQ like we saw today, past performance questionnaire. And then they'll ask us for experience. They'll give us those experience questions. At the end of the day, we're giving contracting what they ask for to be compliant and competitive in our bids. That's the end goal. But it'll throw you if you find yourself, and you will if you're in this long enough, when you find a solicitation that asks you for past performance and then it asks past performance and then it asks you for past experience. And you're like, what? Because I remember it clear as day the first time I experienced that, I'm like, it's, they're asking for the same thing twice. No, they're not. There's technically a difference between the two. So hopefully that helps. Uh, I recommend having your own insurance. You know, your subs should also, you know, be insured and bonded or whatever, depending on what their scope is. But you want to have your own general liability insurance as a prime. Uh, anytime you get awarded a contract, you want to make sure you have those minimum limits just to protect yourself. It's not that expensive. It's a business write-off just be professional and legitimate and safe and have that. Um, we got one more bid, which is the strong bonds event. Of course, this is going to be army. 
This is due January 19th, small business set aside, 561510 travel agency NAICS code. If you didn't know it existed, it does. Uh, Baraboo, Wisconsin, questions are due by the 11th. Bids are due a week later by the 19th. We have a statement of work and a solicitation, but you can already see here's another one of those clues. Here's another one of those little pieces of evidence. RFQ, solicitation number. And just by the nature of this being strong bonds event, we know it's going to mostly be booking rooms. So it makes sense that it's going to be price driven. So this is going to be price only, or it's going to be price driven with uh, potentially a small little write up. We're not sure yet, but we already know that without even looking at it. These are good skills to develop. So this is 13 pages. We have one pricing CLIN for the whole event. They're telling us February 2nd, third and fourth, three days. Evaluation factors are technical and price. So we already knew price. So now they're saying technical. Technical means conforms with the PWS, which means it's probably gonna be pass fail. The very next line, LPTA. So all LPT, LPTA today, all lowest price bids on today's episode. And we understand why, because they're price motivated, they're price driven. And honestly, I think every bid we looked at today is below supplied acquisition too. It's below, probably below 250K. I mean, maybe the BPA, but we don't know what all those task orders would add up to. So, but for your pricing for the BPA response, I think that would still be below, below the SAT. Okay. So we, we pretty much have none of the sections that we've seen today or like what, like what we likely see. Again, we're facing technical acceptability conformance with the PWS. without any further explanation. Kind of, not even kind of, it, it ended up being the theme for the day. So we're gonna once again be totally reliant on the PWS, submitting our files and answering the how are we going to do this? The how is gonna be much more specific though, because we know it's September 2nd, 3rd, 4th. We know, well, we know the location. I'm looking for like a, a radius mile radius we know it's 80 rooms per night um they're saying 110 att attendees with 40 children so we have these little very important details to answer the how and this how is really going to be like we're booking the hotel and it has enough room for these particular dates three to nine eight thirty to two eight thirty to ten thirty not that big of a deal to include the meeting room right to include the AV table and setup, to include a water station and coffee to be supplied, which very often the hotel is going to have all of this. So you're asking these questions when you call the hotel. Do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have that? Not that hard. More of an audiovisual breakout. Now meals. That's where it gets interesting. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <clears throat> hotel shall provide. Hotel shall provide. Hotel shall provide. They don't want to be going off site. And it, saying hotel shall provide, it's not even look like they're opening to catering. And my guess is you wouldn't be cost competitive if you were doing catering. So you're wanting to find a hotel that is providing all of this. And you know how I know this guys, the real truth is they already know what hotel they want to use. And the, they know they've come to that decision knowing the hotel provides all of this. So now we're just trying to find the hotel that they picked. It may be obvious. It may not be so obvious, but I guarantee you, they have one, if not two, and they've probably already used these hotels many times in the past. This is not a, a new need. So they're already familiar with this and the Baraboo, Wisconsin uh, radius. Okay. So that's not going to probably be too, too many options that satisfy what they're asking for. Break time snacks. And then it's going to come down to your price. Okay. It's, it's a little, it's a little game. So guys, I hope you enjoyed our first episode kicking off of the year. Many of you have ordered the book. 
Make sure you check out the book if you have not. We also have the LMM course if you want the templates, the training, the videos, everything slowed down, example, step by step. Um, it's not just middle mannings, okay, guys? We're not just focusing on middle manning. It's just using a middleman strategy. But all the if you're just needing bidding support, it's there. If you're needing to know how to respond to the proposals, it's there. If you're needing to work for subs, it's there. It's just the bow we put on this is legal middlemaning. But I know a lot of you are like, oh, I don't know if it's for me because I don't necessarily know if I'm wanting to middleman. Well, the rest of it is there. So for example, the book, the table of contents is literally on the site. Click on it. You can see all the chapters. Don't let that hold you back. If you're needing support, see if it's a fit. If it's not, it's not. That's cool. But I don't want you, you being held back, right? And then the same for the course. And you can check all this out once again at Legal Middleman dot com to kick your new year off strong if you already got the book i hope you're enjoying it hope you're, you're reading it um and yeah guys uh we got a, a new day and a new time we're doing mondays so we'll continue to move forward uh with next week doing our next episode and i look forward to see all of you guys then have a great week say a prayer for me with the weather and everybody around me and if you're down here in the south be safe as well and i'll see you guys very soon take care and great questions today everybody